in accordance with Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law in relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public, the City Council will be conducting this hearing virtually. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while adhering to public health recommendations and ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. This public hearing is being recorded and live streamed on www.boston.gov slash City Council TV. It will also be rebroadcast at a later date on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, and Fios 964. Anyone that would like to testify on this matter, please email ron.cobb at boston.gov for the Zoom link. That is ron, R-O-N dot cobb, C-O-B-B, at boston.gov for the Zoom link. Today's hearing is on docket number 0222, order for a hearing to discuss water rescue infrastructure in the city of Boston. This matter is sponsored by myself and city councilor Lydia Edwards and was referred to the Committee on City Neighborhood Services on January 27, 2021. I'm just checking to see what colleagues are here right now so I can recognize them. <clears throat> I, I will recognize them when they do get on this on, onto the meeting. Um, my colleague, City Councilor Edwards, um, has a letter that she would like me to read into the record at this time. Re absence of for docket 022 order for a hearing to discuss water rescue infrastructure in the city of Boston. Dear Chair Flynn, I regret to inform you that I will be unable to attend docket 0222 order for a hearing to discuss water rescue infrastructure in the city of Boston. As the district council with the most waterfront in the district, this particular topic is of utmost importance to me. Please be assured that my staff will be attending and taking notes. I will be following up with you personally. Many thanks for your continued steadfast leadership in this area. Sincerely, Lydia Edwards, Boston City Council, District 1. Boston is a city surrounded by water. And over the years, with the increase of visitors and tourists to our city, we unfortunately see incidents of people falling into the ocean. In recent years, there have been several incidents where people have fallen into the water and required assistance from our first responders. As a result, residents have advocated for life-saving rings to be installed at Fort Point in near public docks in case of incidents, accidents of people falling in. There were also suggestions that all docks and marinas along Fort Point in the waterfront should be equipped with water rescue equipment, such as life-saving rings and other flotation device as part of the city's public safety plan. So we, have, we are happy to discuss existing infrastructure in place for rescuing those who fall into the ocean as well as talking about ways that we can further improve water safety for all. I'm really honored to have so many dedicated city and state employees that are here with us. Um, and I wanna recognize you for, for being here, but more importantly, for your leadership on this issue, but other issues on public safety across our, our city and our commonwealth. Our invited panel today includes the Boston Fire Commissioner, Commissioner Jack Dempsey, Sergeant Michael Coyne, who's a harbor master for the Boston Police Department. We also have the fire chief the Ma from the Massachusetts Port, Port Authority, Fire Chief Joe DeGrace. We also have Thomas Butler from Massachusetts Port Authority, 
and the Government Affairs Division. We also have a, a community panel as well. And the other part of this hearing, I wanted to focus on swimming and making sure young people across our city, especially our students, also have the um, availability to get swimming lessons, whether they're through the YMCA, they're through the BCYF, Boston Center Youth and Families, or through the pu public schools. Swimming lessons for children um, and students is very important. We have James Morton, who's the CEO of the YMCA, that is here with us. We have Amy Gamachi Turner, Chief Program Officer for the YMCA of Greater Boston, who's, who's also here with us. We also have Sarah McCammond, who's, all, who's with the Harborfront Alliance, who provided written testimony, with, which I have, but I'm gonna give her the option of, of, of weighing in as well. Um, at this time, I would like to ask the city and state panel that are, that are here to offer opening statements. I, I, I would like to ask if the fire commissioner would like to go first. Um, commissioner Dempsey, thank you for being with us. Commissioner Dempsey, thank you for your leadership on this issue, but so many issues across the city of Boston. Thank, thank you, Council Flynn. Uh, so the, the Boston Fire Department has a large amount of water rescue capabilities. Uh, we have a Marine unit that's co comprised of a fully manned unit. Uh, and they often conduct drills with the Coast Guard, Massport, uh, Boston Police, State Police, and Environmental Police Marine units. Uh, the Marine unit also carries a side scan sonar for underwater recovery. We also have a dive team, uh, which uh, is uh, 20 divers when it's fully activated. The team is assigned to various companies in the city and upon request are sent to the incident scene. They drill once a month on all types of incidents, including ice rescue, deep water, shallow water, piers, et cetera. And uh, they're very well trained and have been called to incidents in other towns. Uh, they also, we also have a dive team boat that they deploy. Uh, we have swift water rescue teams. Uh, both engine and ladder companies uh, in the city carry life rings for quick deployment. All Boston ladder companies have survival suits that are donned while en route to the water rescue, to the water incident. And they drill on water rescue with the suits, which allow you to float and become a flotation device for the person being rescued. Both Rescue One and Rescue Two have Zodiac boats available for quick deployment. Uh, this past year, we've, had, we've already had 106 uh, water calls. Uh, they vary in different types from, uh, you know, so, sometimes we get a call, somebody's on a, a surfboard or whatever out there just resting. So uh, some of these calls are really not a rescue, but uh, they, nevertheless, they're a call. So, uh, so some of the uh, recommendations that I would uh, ask, uh, so in order to put these resources into action, we need to be notified, and then even the quickest response does take time. Whenever a rescue is necessary, whether it's a fire or a water rescue, it's always time sensitive. With water rescues, you also have to deal with accessibility, freezing water, darkness, and currents. The way to improve survivability at these incidents would be to get direct assistance from the public and property owners in the area. The fastest and cheapest solution is to have life rings or a type of flotation device ready, readily available for immediate deployment. Throwing a life ring to someone in the water will save their life. It gives us valuable time to respond and recover them before they sink below the surface. A submerged person is much more difficult to locate and survivability decreases rapidly. This simple device will keep them above water, even when the water is freezing cold. A light and whistle attached can also be helpful, especially at night. If every restaurant, hotel, or business on the waterfront had one of these available, it would make life-saving, sa uh, it would make a life-saving difference. 
they could make it look nautical with the name of the restaurant or hotel on it. Uh, you know, all Coast Guard cutters have the name of the ship on them. Uh, so with the availability comes necessary training for the staff. Uh, they should be instructed to throw the device to the person in the water and then call 911 immediately. A rope attached will allow for retrieval. A drill on how to throw a life ring would benefit everyone and could be a fun exercise. Um, also helpful will be ladders ascending to the water from piers at different locations. The problem with this is that the ladders often get damaged by boats and the effects of salt water. Finally, better lighting on piers and the waters at, at the water's edge would help. There are often tripping hazards near the edge uh, that, that might be avoided with better lighting. Uh, so that's pretty much all I have uh, for now, and I'm available any, for any questions. Thank you, Council. You're muted. I think you're muted. Thank you, Commissioner. The, your comments were very informative and very helpful. And as, as you know, I use these hearings as an opportunity to educate the public that might be watching, and hopefully we're able to educate the public on these critical issues. So thank you for that explanation, Commissioner Dempsey. Um, let me go next to... Um, let me go next to Sergeant Michael Coyne, Harbor, Ma Harbor Master at the Boston Police Department, someone someone we have great respect for, their, their team as well. So uh, thank you, Sergeant, for being with us. Thank you for the, uh, the tremendous work your team does on the, on the, um, in, in the ocean and uh, working closely with residents as well. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, good morning, Councilor Flynn. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, go back. Uh, in 2021, uh, the Boston Police Harbor Patrol Unit has either assisted or has been responsible for uh, 13 water rescues this year, uh, three body recoveries, and as well as 20 alert twos from Logan Airport when a plane is in distress. Uh, we, we will scramble units and have them on standby. Um, relative to this um, infrastructure bill, I had just gone online and just started shopping around a little and to install a life ring cabinet which um, will come with the plastic cabinet a life ring in anywhere from 50 to 75 feet of line ranges anywhere from 250 dollars to about 500 dollars per unit so it's not it's not a huge investment um it's um you know it's very cost effective probably the biggest thing would be maintaining it over time uh, sunlight will break down the polypropylene line on the life rings. So it might have, um, you know, like an inspection date. Uh, this could be something, as the fire commissioner stated, if every um, restaurant or waterfront property were required uh, through the building codes to maintain it, um, have like a, a, a yearly or bi-yearly inspection of the lines and the equipment uh, as far as replacement. And then the replacement cost, once the cabinet is installed, is, is nominal nominal they're about a hundred dollars a piece uh including the line so uh it's not a huge a huge burden um uh, and also i'm kind of uh we have a missing person incident that's going on i have a boat on standby and it may possibly turn into a water recovery so i may have to um leave the meeting early uh, just to waiting for further information um but as far as um water infrastructure i know Downtown, the um, where I served as a patrol supervisor for 10 years, all the patrol supervisor cars had life rings and they had throw bags. A throw bag is just, it's a canvas bag with about 50 feet of line. Uh, has a shorter end of line that you step on and then you can heave the bag out to somebody in the water. Um, very cheap, they're about $50 a piece. So uh, as far as the equipment, it's, it's uh, reasonably priced and I think it can go a long way. We... Um, Unfortunately, we live in a cold climate, and the first thing to go when people are submerged in the water are their extremities. They lose their arms, they lose their legs, and they because uh, the body wants to shut down and maintain the core. Um, so that's when people run into problems when they go and fall off of these piers. Um, you know, a lot of these piers at low tide, you could have 20 feet of sheer wall to the top of the pier uh, with no, no means of getting out, and that's where some of the people late night have fallen into problems and 
over the years. Um, you know, they hit the water and they can only stay afloat for so long in the freezing temperatures. So there may there. I didn't look at um, um, recovery ladders, but I know they're out there. Uh, it could be something as simple as a Jacob's ladder that you pull two pins and the thing unfolds. But I'm sure they probably fall in the same cost range as as the life rings. And um, I mean, I could look into that a little further and uh, try to get a price point on that. Well, thank thank you, Sergeant, for your testimony. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for your leadership and the, and the leadership of your team as well. And certainly you guys are on standby now, so feel free to jump off at this meeting anytime. Um, not, not, not an issue. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Tommy Butler, who is the government affairs person at Massport, if he will introduce um, Chief Joe DeGrace. Uh, Tommy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you uh, for having us this morning. My name is Tommy Butler. I'm the Deputy Director of uh, Community Relations and Government, of, Government Affairs at Massport. And um, just to start off, you know, at Massport, safety and security is the uh, top priority in our mission. Uh, we also um, own a significant amount of waterfront property in South Boston, East Boston, and Charlestown that are under uh, ground leases. Uh, so we uh, greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate and also to you and, and Councillor Edwards uh, for filing uh, the motion for this uh, important hearing on, on um, water safety and infrastructure. And uh, I'm joined by my colleague in Massport Fire, uh, Chief Joe DeGrace, who will uh, lead the testimony. Good morning. I'm Chief Joe DeGrace. I'm Chief of Massport Fire Rescue. As you know, we're here at the airport and um, our water infrastructure is designed to make rescues for any type of aircraft or any incident that happens in the water. When we're surrounded 75% by water, we have to be prepared. So what we have available for the traveling public and for the city of Boston and the neighboring communities up and down the, um, the shore here of Massachusetts. We have um, a fully staffed Marine unit. Our Marine captains um, all have the U.S. Coast Guard merchants, Mariner 100 ton license. And we have a staff that's on four groups, four, four, four people per, per group. And then we have a number of people back at the station that are also certified to operate on our marine unit. So in case you need need us over there, the city of Boston, fire department, Coast Guard, Boston PD, we're available to respond and to um, assist in all, all capacities. We have um, three marine units. We have Marine 31, which is our big vessel, a 79-foot vessel, which has the capability of um, working as a rescue platform for up to 100 people. We have the capability to, to deploy life rafts that can support 300 people. We designed that for aircraft of different sizes, which are also valuable in any type of water incident that we have in the harbor or further out. We have Marine 32, which is our moose boat, which is um, a 38-foot boat that has the capability of, of having 80-plus people on life rafts in case we have an incident within the harbor. Um, they are also manned by a Marine captain that has their merchants mariner 100 ton license. Um, we host a number of events, exercises in the water with Boston, Boston police and, um, and the Coast Guard. We just actually did one um, about a month ago, which is our disaster exercise, which you know we can't accomplish without the help of Boston Fire, Boston PD and the Coast Guard. And those are always um, valuable to have. I mean, any support that, that the community of the city of Boston can give for more training, more joint training for all of our departments is, is valuable. Um, like I said, we, we respond 15 miles from the center of the airport all the way out north and south. We've been as far as Plymouth. We go as far as Gloucester if, if needed. And um, with all the properties at Massport lease in the Boston waterfront, we will respond there to assist Boston Fire as needed. We've done, um, since the beginning of the year, about 100 calls of all different types. 
water rescues to assist Boston Fire, Boston Police. We've, we do our alerts that we have to stand by in case something happens um, to an aircraft that falls short on a takeoff problem. Um, you know, we see it as a, as a major part of our operation. The Massport spends a lot of money to, um, to make sure that our Marine unit is up and running and um, fully staffed and, and fully trained. And um, so this is value. This, this meeting is great that people recognize how valuable this waterfront is and, uh, and how dangerous it could be. So um, if you have any other questions, just feel free to ask and uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chief DeGrace, for your leadership and the important role you play and your team plays. And what I especially liked about your comments, uh, Chief, is the ongoing working relationship you have with the Boston Fire Department, with the Boston Police Department. So just want to acknowledge that and say thank you. That's, that's exactly what we need to be doing is working together as a team and it's one team and rescuing people at, especially in need. So I want to say thank you to our Massport team, our, our Boston Police and Boston Fire team for that close, that close working relationship. Thank you. It's a credit to the leadership over in Boston and both the police and the fire department and also um, with the Coast Guard. But th thank you. Thank you. I'm just checking to see if my colleagues are on. No, I'll, I'll get to my colleagues when they when they arrive. Um, let me let me start. Let me start maybe with the fire commissioner or or, or, or whoever wants to take it. Um, the the rings commissioner that we were talking about possibly you know we, we we could possibly get some in restaurants we'd have to have a plan and a structured plan on it um in training for the in training for the staff um what what impact would they have when when someone is in the water and you throw that ring to them does that significantly significantly increase the odds of of keeping that person alive? I, I think it's uh, I think it is a lifesaver. That's what they call lifesaver rings, right? Uh, it, it no matter when we get the call, it's going to take us a few minutes to get there. And as uh, uh, Sergeant Coyne said, if it's a cold water, uh, the ability to to uh, tread water for a long time is going to uh, uh, become shorter and shorter. So uh, that's going to keep somebody above water, and, and that makes uh, rescue so much easier. Uh, you can also realize that there's currents, you know, the tides coming in, going out. Uh, if they go underwater, we're, we're going to lose them. Uh, even, even if they're treading water, they could be carried out further uh, with the currents, uh, which makes it a little bit harder to reach. So. But if they're on a life ring, we can pick them up with the boat. Uh, uh, or our survival suits, we have uh, people on a line with that. They can swim out pretty good, pretty far distance, and and uh, we become the life ring then. And then they then the people on shore just pull them in. So, uh, but but it's it's not that big of an expense, and it's something you know that that I think uh, if we have enough of them around, it's very easy to deploy. Uh, even if you miss them, uh, you get it close to them. Hopefully, a person can get to it. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, maybe following, maybe following up with um, on on that question with with Sergeant with Sergeant Coin or or with the Chief as well. I'm sorry, Chief, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Chief. Yeah, just to emphasize the point by the commissioner, um, what it also does, um, it prevents other people from jumping into the water to, to complicate the issue of, of life, safety, and rescue. Instead, now you have one person in floating with a life ring as opposed to someone else jumping in to try to save this person and meets the same fate as the person that went in initially. So, I mean, it's invaluable. It's kind of like having AEDs around. It keeps people alive until the rescuers can get there, and then we can make the save. And um, it's invaluable, to, in my opinion. That, that, that's a great point. 
Yeah, thank, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, thank you, Chief. Um, let, let me let me go to Sergeant Coyne. Um, you know, I, I take like like all of you, I take this I issue very seriously because not only do I represent the area, um, but I also had the opportunity to serve 24 years in, in the U.S. Navy, and the, these types of issues we trained on and, and were educated on and were an important part of our, our life, really. Um, one, one concern I have, um, Sergeant Coyne, is maybe it's anecdotal, but I often read about, unfortunately, people that are at, at bars or restaurants and they're, you know, unfortunately, they're drinking and that they might be in and around the waterfront in the downtown area and they, they fall in into the ocean. Maybe it's down towards like the aquarium area or, or yeah. some area like that. But the el someone drinking alcohol and then that falls falls into the ocean, they're at that they're really in danger of, of drowning when that happens. But is is th is that common that, that that happens, Sergeant, or is it just that we hear about it a couple times a year? Uh, for for a while, um I've been with the dive team since 2005. Um, and for a while, we had one a winter for about four or five years. Then it, um, then it kind of tapered off. Uh, it really, we haven't been called out uh, really since when COVID shut everything down. Um, uh, like I said, this incident that we're currently looking into right now may be an incident like that. We're just still trying to put together video and uh, trying to get more information before we uh, do a full water search. So um, um, I know um, a few years back um, when a, a young man fell off behind the Tower A Bridge, behind the Boston Garden, there was, there was nobody around. It was the Charles River Basin. It was cold. It was dark, and there's a strong current there because of the uh, flood control that keeps the uh, Charles River levels um, at a at a proper at a proper level, so they don't flood out the Charles River Basin. Um, these incidents do happen, um, and I know a lot of the uh, our licensing division tries to stay on top of these bars that they're not over serving people. Um, I was actually just having a conversation with uh, Sergeant Gallagher prior to this uh, meeting um, uh, relative to the ongoing incident, but uh, they try to stay on top of these bars to, uh, because that's what the issue usually happens mm -hmm. when it happens. It's uh, somebody's overserved, they're alone, it's two o'clock in the morning, they fall in somewhere and there's no exit. It's dark, they're confused, they're under the influence and you know they're faced with a sheer wall. Uh, I've been on many a call, many a... Um, of recovery search uh where that was um uh, the the incident that led up to the um to the actual uh, cause of them falling in you know um i i can think of a half dozen off the top of my head right now um but it is it's um it's something um you know if there was some kind of i don't know like i said if there was some kind of exit and that's the issue as the uh Fire Commissioner said the ladders are going to face, um, they're going to degrade over time. And, uh, you know, you have electrolysis, so ungrounded electrical current and salt water, it eats up the metal. So it would be something that would be constantly replaced. Um, there, there might be some more feasible um, w ways of uh, egress from the water. Um, that's what I said earlier, that maybe looking into like a Jacob's Ladder type system where people can get themselves up and out and out of harm's way. Uh, that's something that I, I said I'd like to take another look at. Uh, but uh, as far as that, that's unfortunately a lot of these docks and piers were built for commercial use over the years, and they were meant for ships to come up alongside. And, um, you know, these late hours, we don't have people out there. Uh, and um, and that's, that's, you know, unfortunate. Thank you, Sergeant. And let me let me ask one one final question, and may, maybe you all can respond to it, um, and then we'll go to our next panel. But we see a lot of people on boats in the summertime, and people that have boats, you know, 
they might be they might be an expert um, in 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 operating the boat, the boat, but they also might not have they they also might have limited experience in it. Um, what are we doing to educate people that have boats about boating safety, driving carefully, but also operating the boat appropriately, making sure that life rafts are, are there and really discouraging the use of um, alcohol as it relates to boating is, is also a concern. I know, I know it happens, but um, it's, it, it, sometimes it almost seems like it's okay to go out on a boat and, and, and have a few drinks, but that's really the wrong message now. And we want to make sure that anyone that operates a boat is operating that boat carefully, safely, and appropriately. So just, just want to get your thoughts about that. Uh, well, in the city of Boston, first off, we have um, a no wake zone, and um, basically from the uh, airport hotel to the um, Boston um, Tuna, there was no wakes in the Inner Harbor, which caused a lot of damage, uh, can knock people out of boats, and uh, so we do active wake enforcement uh, in the summertime during the uh, during the uh, height of the boating season. Uh, also, the entire unit is been trained um as was mentioned before um a lot of the fire and law enforcement um agencies in the area we all belong to a group called champ it's the commonwealth harbor masters and marine professionals group they conduct training under what is uh the nasla standard which uh, a bunch of coasties got together and standardized marine rescue training and operation so uh this all falls into the fact that we all receive port grants so we become regional assets and we all train together uh, we are trained in uh, boating under the influence detection. Uh, it's slightly different than um, dry land sobriety test, uh, where you know you can't have somebody um, walk in a straight line. There's a, a thing referred to as the seated battery, where this dexterity test that you do with your hands while seated. So everyone in the unit is trained on that, um, as well as uh, officers from the state police marine unit and the uh, mass environmental police who are also stationed in Boston Harbor, and we all work well together. Um, the Coast Guard Auxiliary does um, um, safety ex inspections, so relative to boats having required uh, safety equipment, all boats are required to have, you know, life jackets, uh, um, uh, something that they can throw, either a life ring or a seated a seat cushion that can float. Um, this way, if there is an incident where there's someone in the water, you can create what we like to refer to as a debris field. Um, in a, an accident that happened this past summer uh, out at Day Marker 5, when two, I have two officers on the midnight shift, uh, they were the first on scene and they had seven people in the water. Um, they had to create, a, they basically had to create a debris field by throwing several life jackets overboard. And they had a triage who was the most serious in that group that had to get boarded first. While they were doing that, the other people had something to hold on to. Um, and they were all eventually rescued. Massport fire came over, U.S. Coast Guard responded, and uh, seven out of the eight persons were recovered. Um, so, I mean, as far as teamwork and as far as um, training, that's all paid off. Um, as far as recreational boaters in the real world, most of the time, uh, the first boat on scene is going to be a wreck boat or a lobster boat or somebody that's out there. Um, I generally have one patrol boat for 42 square miles of water that uh, we're responsible for covering. And uh, oftentimes, you know, we get out there and, and somebody has them on board. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate about that. Um, most of the Marine professionals in the area monitor uh, channel 13 and channel 16 on their radios. Um, so they'll give us a shout if they, you know, if there's something going on out on the harbor. Um, as far as, um, the wake enforcement, like I said, we, uh, actively pursue that July, August at the height of the boating season, uh, because that's a situation awake in Boston Harbor is something that could eject somebody from a smaller boat into the water. And so we take that very seriously. Um, my units are out there, um, uh, and they're, you know, for the most part, they're stopping the operators, explaining to them, you know, asking where are they from, because some people are not familiar with the harbor. You know, they're coming up from other other 
states or whatever, and they're they're coming through and they're doing you know 20 knots when they should be doing clutch speed basically. Uh, so we we try to educate the operators, and um, you know from time to time we have to cite people. You know, if they're repeat offenders or if they just don't seem to get it and, uh, you know, the safety of, that's involved in this. Thank you, Sergeant. Chief, I, I don't know if you were trying to speak, but I think you're on mute. No, I, no I'm, I have nothing to add. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, just say the uh, the Coast Guard offers uh, border safety courses, uh, so for new boaters and and as you go up to uh, to the uh, amount of people you're going to be carrying on the boat, there's different licenses. So uh, that's a great alternative for people, especially new boaters should be taking these courses. It'll uh, help them. Uh, know the rules of the road out there and uh, and uh, a lot of safety tips uh, as uh, Sergeant Coyne was saying uh, that would be helpful. Uh, also they help enforce the uh, there is no uh, you know drinking and driving when you're driving a boat as well so that that's a law. That, thank you Commissioner. Uh, so Commissioner and Chief and Sergeant and the sergeant, um, I'm going to go to the next panel. Um, you can certainly stay on if, if you would like. Um, it's not necessary. We probably won't go back to you. But I, I, but I first want to say thank you for being here, for the important work you're doing. Um, it's greatly appreciated across the city, across, across the Commonwealth also. And what I would like to do with this hearing is maybe get together again after the new year in February, have a similar hearing and maybe focus a little more on the rings and maybe trying to develop a, a pilot program with some of the restaurants or the or the hotels in a certain area and maybe maybe get a little maybe do a little bit of um, outreach to some of the residents and the restaurants and the property owners and maybe we can get a pilot program going for for next year. Um, but I'll stay in contact with you and, and I'll probably reach out to you guys again um, sometime in January or, Feb or February, if that's okay. All right, definitely. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, one last thing, Councilor. There, is, um, there was a bill that was sent up uh, from the late Harbor Master Paul Malone from Weymouth and it does involve licensing of boat operators in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Where it stands in committee, I don't know, but it was submitted uh, probably last year sometime. So yeah, I was I was thinking about that, Sergeant. So do you need a, a, a driver's license to, to operate a boat? No, you don't. Uh, the, the only time licensing really comes into effect is... Um, when you're getting into uh, commercial and you're required your Coast Guard licenses, uh, whether it's a six pack to run a charter or we're very similar to the, um, to the mass port fire, we have a um, hundred ton certification. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's something I would support the, the proposed legislation of, of making sure that someone has a, a license to drive, a, um, drive a, a small boat anyway. Um, I think it's it protects him and it, her, but it protects the public as well. The Boston Harbor Safety Committee, which is uh, an area, uh, you know, regional people in the uh, in the maritime industry, they have a meeting coming up in December, and I can check on the status of where th that bill sits at this time. Okay, let's let's stay in uh, contact, Sergeant. Again, I want to say thank you to Sergeant Coyne and, and Chief DeGrace and. And Commissioner Dempsey and, and, and Tommy Butler um, as well. So greatly appreciate you being here. Again, not necessary for you guys to stay on. You're more than welcome to. But I'm going to go to the next panel. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to ask the next panel to to join us, and that includes James Morton, who's the CEO of the YMCA. I would like to ask Amy Gamachi Turner, also with the YMCA of Greater Boston, 
and C.R. McCammon as well. C.R. is a resident of the Four Point Neighborhood Association and active with um, Harborfront Neighborhood Alliance. So, I also want to acknowledge the support and testimony and advocacy and leadership of the Fort Point Neighborhood Association. They provided excellent feedback to me in this committee on the importance of this issue, and they actually recommended to me to have such a hearing. So when residents reach out to me and ask me to conduct a hearing, um, I usually do it, and especially if I think it's a it's an important issue such as this. So I want to say thank you to the Fort Point Neighborhood Association. Um, let me let me now go to um, Sarah from the neighborhood, the Harborside Neighborhood Alliance. Um, Sarah, thank you for being with us. Would you like to offer opening an opening statement or an opening comment, Sarah? Uh, thank you, Councillor Flynn. I'd be happy just to introduce myself um, and why we as an organization are very interested. Also, um, thank you for the kind words um, to the FPNA, the Fort Point Neighborhood uh, Association. They are a member um, of our organization as well. As I mentioned, my name is Sarah McCammond. I'm executive director of the Harborfront Neighborhood Alliance. We bring together neighborhood associations to ensure that resident voices uh, affect the growth, development, and sustainability of an accessible Boston waterfront from East Boston to Charlestown to the North End to downtown South Boston and Dorchester. And as residents, we live on the waterfront and we enjoy an active harbor as advocates for a public accessibly inclusive and resilient waterfront, it's vital that we make the waterfront a welcoming and safe place to be. I look forward to being on the panel with these esteemed colleagues. Thank you, Sarah, for your testimony, for your leadership. Um, Ron, I was just wondering if the team from the YMCA um, is on yet? Well, we're checking now, Councilor. Yeah, yeah, James Morton just raised his hand, uh, Ron. Sierra, let me let me go to you. Um, I know you're active in the Ford Point Neighborhood Association, and one of the things that always concerned me, Sarah, is basically from South Station walking to Summer Street. And I asked Sergeant Coyne this: walking to Summer Street, heading towards South Boston, especially people walking that late at night. Maybe it's a summer summer night. There's so many avenues where that person, unfortunately, if they're under the influence of, of alcohol and the drinking, um, could fall over into the ocean, whether it's on, on Summer Street or it's near the New England Aquarium area and people making bad decisions. But I think having those life rings might be helpful. Just want to get your thoughts on that, Sarah. Absolutely, Councillor Flynn. Um, we definitely agree with the uh, panel that presented before us, um, the commissioner and the sergeant and um, gentleman from Massport, that having life rings um, is critical. Um, you know, we see that people fall in, um, as you mentioned, um, you know, from bridges, from the shoreline, and to be able to have life rings readily accessible. Um, in some of those locations and more frequently along our waterfront, um, I think we, it would be a valuable um, way to reduce um, water best skew uh, or water, definitely water recovery. Mm -hmm. um, what other concerns do you have in and around the Fort Point area, certainly in the South Boston waterfront, the seaport area, in and around the Moakley Courthouse. What are, what are some of the concerns you have in that area as well, Sarah? 
Sure. I think that just like um, around the harbor, we're seeing um, incredible growth. Obviously, we see that in, in the seaport that's just kind of been a neighborhood that's come into being in the last few years. We're seeing greater um, development coming to the Fort Point Channel and um, even around um, the downtown waterfront um, as there's new plans there. Um, so we see that there's more people as a result of this development, obviously coming to these waterfronts to either live, to work, and to visit. And um, with that, and whether they're visiting the waterfront and restaurants, or they're actually on the water themselves, and given the increase in the pandemic of people wanting to be outside and be on the water, um, this has become a very critical issue for us, um, one that we think there's multiple solutions um, from the water rescue devices that were mentioned for bringing in um, more ladders um, along the the edge, the hard edges um, of seawalls with grab chains. Um, I know that they both the sergeant and the commissioner mentioned the that this would be a solution. We also want to reiterate that. They need to be maintained if they are going to be installed. And for example, um, there was a ladder um, across from uh, Christopher Columbus Park. Um, it was, I'm not sure the history on it, but it is there no longer. So it just speaks to the importance of maintenance and to having these ladders, you know, really throughout the Boston waterfront as a way for people to get out of the water. Um, I think the commissioner also spoke to, you know, the invaluableness of, uh, and, and the sergeant and others of having those right life rings available to throw to keep somebody afloat until water rescue can get there. Um, there's also the importance of training those people. Um, and I would be also interested as, you know, as the public may be the ones responding to having that training of what is the best way to throw um, a water bag or a, a, a life um, saver into a person. Um, and, and the other issue that um, in terms of rescue um, is the fact that how do you identify a water location of where someone needs rescue in a way that the responders can find quickly? And as we look at... Um, We'd like to the city to consider and partners, state partners, is there some sort of a, a, a marker system? And maybe with call boxes like you have on water taxis or um, other ways where we can then more readily pinpoint where the rescue is, is needed. Um, in those communications. But those are just some of my thoughts. And I know we've got some other panelists on and I'd be happy to say you know, more um, as time permits. Well, well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for being with us and the important testimony you provided. We're also joined by James Morton from the uh, YMCA. And James, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here with us. One of the, one of the reasons I, I wanted you to, I, I wanted to invite you is over the last several years, one of the issues of great concern to me and I've talked to the Boston Public Schools and I talked to the BCYF, Boston Children, Youth and Families that operate many of the swimming pools in, in Boston. Um, one of the concerns for me, um, especially and for, and for residents of Boston, we don't necessarily provide swimming lessons to children in, in, in the city of Boston. My, my two children, we were able to pay to have them to have them have swimming lessons at a at a private pool. I I was fortunate enough. My wife was fortunate enough to have money to do that. Um, but other kids, other students, aren't so fortunate. Um, many many kids, students, communities of color um, don't have that same option. And. My goal is to try to get as many youth in Boston with swimming lessons, teach them about water safety, teach them about respecting the ocean, 
respecting the lakes um, and pools and in how important they are, but also how in, how dangerous they are. Right. And so having said that, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, James Morton for being here. And James, this is, uh, if you'd like to offer an opening opening statement. Um, uh, sure. Uh, first of all, let me let me let me begin by by thanking thanking you, Councillor Flynn, uh, and your colleague uh, Councillor <clears throat> Edwards for uh, for ins for elevating this really critically important conversation. Um, you know, I, I I remember as a high school student uh, in Wisconsin where we had lots of lakes. Uh, we were not allowed to graduate from high school unless we could prove that we could swim. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to the university. And we couldn't graduate from the university unless we could pass a swim test. Um, but that was a different, that was a different, you know, an age in time. But but I think there were lessons in that that, that we can learn for today. Um, I, I really, really appreciate uh, all that we've heard this morning about the infrastructure uh, that exists uh, in the city of Boston to, to keep to keep all of us uh, safe and keep our waterways and the harbor uh, safe from drownings. Um, and you know, what a tremendous infrastructure we already have in place. And clearly, there's more that we can do. And and it, there also appears to be an incredible appetite to do more. Um, but with with that said, I believe that the first line of defense uh, to drowning is to teach children how to swim, uh, and 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 also to teach them water safety, uh, how to how to as you say how to respect and appreciate this beautiful you know waterfront uh, this forty five plus miles of waterfront shoreline that we have in the city of Boston, how to respect it and appreciate it and preserve it, but also how to keep themselves. Uh, safe uh, around it. And, and so, um, you know, we've seen an increase in the number of drownings, 2018, 99 drownings, and 2020, 125 drownings in Massachusetts. And we're probably, unfortunately, going to exceed that this year. And as we all, I'm sure, take the position that, that, that one drowning is too much. Um, and so, um, in terms of uh, introductory remarks, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I, I will offer some very specific um, strategies and tactics that we're employing um, at the YMCA in partnership with a number of other uh, organizations in the city um, uh, at the appropriate uh, time in this conversation. Well, thank you, James, and we look forward to hearing hearing about them. We we appreciate y'all important work and your important leadership of the YMCA. I'm also joined by my by my colleague from Alston and Brighton, uh, Council Liz Braden, who's with us. Um, Council Braden, would you like to offer um, a statement? Thank you, um, Councillor Flynn. I'm, I'm grabbing a snack, so I don't sound very... <laughs> um, this is a really important uh, issue, and um, I really uh, am excited to be part of the conversation on this one. Um, uh, we we out here in Alston Brighton. We're along the Charles River. We have we don't have a seafront necessarily, but um, the proficiency in being able to swim is really vitally important. And um, you know we're excited about the prospect of the DCR uh, re rebuilding uh, the DCR pool um, that was a, a down at uh, the bottom of Brook Street in 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 Brighton. So. We're, we're anticipating that happening sometime in the not too distant future. Uh, so that will offer another amenity for our students to learn to swim in the neighborhood. I think we have, we have, that was a pool. We have, we have a YMCA pool and we have a pool at, um, at up in Cleveland Circle. So we don't have a lot of um, infrastructure in terms of uh, pools for uh, folks to be able to learn to swim. So I, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, so, James, can you talk about any type of partnerships or what you are doing specifically? What is the YMCA doing specifically to educate, train, to provide swimming lessons to the youth of Boston, but especially um, students of color that that may not have been exposed to the ocean or pools or to any type of um, swimming lessons. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. And then, then, and then I might even offer uh, a, 
a suggestion as how we can um, move forward um, to create even greater a greater safety. But um, so uh, as as you as you know, we've got nine YMCA's in the city of Boston, and all of those YMCA's uh, have pools. And so, uh, and and at every location, we're providing swim lessons um, uh, in every neighborhood that we have a YMCA, and that's an ongoing um, a strategy that we offer to make sure that. Uh, we're, we're providing swim lessons to everyone uh, uh, in our community, regardless of their ability to uh, to pay for those lessons. Uh, uh, we have scholarships and financial support uh, so that no uh, person is denied, no child would be denied access to a, a swim lesson or a water safety opportunity because of an inability to pay. And then in the summer, we have uh, 25 uh, camps throughout Greater Boston, and at, at many of those camps, uh, there, there is a waterfront of some sort or another, um, and our, our responsibility there is to teach water safety at all of our camps and also uh, just to provide swim lessons to make sure that all children who are in the water uh, can do so, uh, do so safely. But here's what we're really, really super excited about, and that is um, uh, as a result of a partnership uh, with the city of Boston and Blue, Cl Blue Cross Blue Shield, we were able to put together a, an initiative called Swim uh, Safely Boston. And as part of that initiative, 300 children will be provided with free swim lessons um, uh, at, at our uh, YMCA pools. We will also train 60 high school students to be lifeguards, which is also an incredible need that we have here. There's a shortage of lifeguards in the city of Boston. Now, because of that partnership, we were able to add a new partner to that effort, and that's Boston Triathlon. And they're supporting the effort by uh, providing us with the resources to provide free swim lessons to another 300 children. So now that's 600 children who will get free lessons in the city of Boston, while we're also training 60 potential lifeguards for next summer. Um, and, and we are looking to grow that program because, of course, 300, uh, 600 children is not enough. It is a start. It's a great start, but it's not enough. We want to make sure that every child in the city and knows how to swim. So that's one strategy that, that we're working on. The second strategy that I'm also very excited about is uh, uh, working with uh, Superintendent Casilius of the Boston Public Schools uh, and her team. We are developing a third grade swim program so that every third grader in the city of Boston, and there are 4,000 third graders, so that every third grader is uh, taught to swim um, and, it, and becomes proficient at swimming. And so we're beginning to develop a pilot uh, for that initiative. And uh, the general theme is that we'll start that um, swim uh, uh, initiative in three Boston public schools that have pools, uh, elementary schools and middle schools. And we'll also identify three of our YMCA pools that will also participate in that. And so our, our goal will be to uh, serve as many um, third graders as part of that pilot as we can in hopes of expanding it uh, to serve um, all 4,000 third graders uh, over, the, over the course of time. And that's a very, very exciting uh, opportunity and a wonderful partnership between the YMCA and our public schools, uh, Boston Public Schools. Now, um, I, I shared I, I have an idea. Um, I, I remember my days at the Springfield YMCA um, you know, some, you know, 15 years ago. And in Springfield, there was a, a program sponsored by um, DCR where um, the YMCA would provide training for high school aged uh, uh, young men and women, training them to be lifeguards. And, and we would not be paid as an organization until those young people passed the state exam, qualifying them as lifeguards. And one of the things that they were guaranteed, the, the, the successful graduates of that program, is they were guaranteed a job. So one, they were provided with training. They were secondly provided with a certification. And thirdly, they were provided with a guaranteed summer job if they completed it. Now, that's a, that's a strategy that, 
you know, I'd like to see us uh, uh, grow and expand upon and and develop here, uh, here in the in the city of Boston. And with all the waterfronts and shorelines that we have, uh, obviously there's there would there's clearly a need and demand for for lifeguards. And I'd like to I'd like to see us develop uh, uh, develop something along those lines. And then and then lastly, um, let me thank Sarah for the great work that 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 she's doing. Um, and that is that is absolutely wonderful work. And, and then there's another coalition of individuals who've come together um, and, and they're identified as the coalition for a resilient and inclusive waterfront. So that's like, like this incredibly diverse group of organizations serving uh, the communities across the city of Boston that have come together to make sure that our waterfront in Boston is available to all residents. In particular, making sure that that our black and brown communities have access to the waterfront. And again, while we're providing access, we have to make sure that we're providing folks with uh, swim lessons and water safety. And so I'm, I'm very excited that that you've elevated this conversation. I'm happy to be here with Sarah um, uh, as we as we try to figure out what's the best way to uh, join forces to um, create the greatest uh, uh, opportunities for access to the water and 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 that safe safe access and I'm, I'm so happy to hear that there's this uh, another whole cadre of folks working on the infrastructure to make sure that the infrastructure provides additional safety so thank 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 you for uh, councillor Flynn for bringing this forward thank you thank you James your, your testimony was excellent it was very helpful and I'm so glad that the YMCA is is playing a critical role in educating and training and, and helping our students here in Boston and our our young people, especially our communities of color. That's an issue I'm proud to represent, probably the most diverse district in the city of Boston. Yeah. Um, I have a large um, Chinese community. I have a large Latinx community. I have a large, I, I represent the largest number of residents living in public housing. Yes. Um, and, and, and the residents that live in public housing only they live probably a half a mile away from the ocean, um, but I but I do know that they have not been exposed to swimming lessons. So, what you are doing, James, through the various partnerships, is very helpful. So, I want to say thank you to the YMCA. Um, let me let me ask my colleague before I start um, a, before I ask a question. Let me ask my colleague, Council Braden if she wants to ask any questions to either James or Sarah at this time. No, I, I really, um, I don't have any questions at the moment. I, I think um, increasing access to swim lessons and I'm really excited about the third grade uh, discussion with the BPS. Um, I think all of that is, is critically important. I, I myself, I'm not a, a proficient swimmer. <laughs> Um, and I did take a class at the YMCA in which 95% of the folks in the class were uh, Irish adults who had never learned to swim. We have a great respect for the water, but very few of us are actually good swimmers. But I did go to a, a little country primary school in Northern Ireland, and, and our teacher, uh, the head teacher, had had the uh, experience of having to life save a child in the in, in difficulties in the ocean in the, su the previous summer and she came back and she took all the kids to the local swimming hole <laughs> and taught started to teach them to swim or even be able to tread water and 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 keep themselves safe uh, after that experience so I, I really feel that um uh, this, this is a, a very very important uh, life skill for everyone to have so i really applaud your efforts and and uh, hope that we can uh, get that to happen thank you so so councillor bryden please come back so we can increase your proficiency um, and, <laughs> and 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 i i am taking constantly taking swim lessons because i i, I want to be able to save my own life in the water and um, and so, uh, and also be an example to others to, to you know, to just as an adult, um, and I'm, I'm an adult in, in, in my 60s, and so I'm in the water trying to make sure that I can be the best swimmer that I can to protect myself and others when the time comes. And, and by the way, I think that, I think that that draw to the water comes from being born in Liverpool. 
<laughs> and um, and so um, uh, having that that birthplace uh, uh, on the on the shore of uh, of, of the ocean, uh, yeah, kind of kind of put it in my soul to to make sure yeah. I can swim. Yeah, it's a dramatic. Uh, it's a really uh, for Irish people uh, this tremendous respect of the water and the ocean, but a very high percentage is of us don't actually swim. So I, I might take you up on your offer and get back in the get back down to the pool and get somebody to teach me how to swim a bit better. Thank you. Well, we'll sure it's very happens. important, you know, it's all it's all as part of it's a mindset <laughs> being afraid of the water. It is. Yeah. And, and we see that as we talk to um, different people and trying to um, open and make our waterfront more inclusive, that it's not only just um, students and, and, and children needing to learn how to swing, but a lot of times adults have yes. not had that opportunity. And as parents, they feel a little trepidatious about bringing their children to the water's edge because they don't know how to swim, so they don't know how to protect them. So um, there's, you know, this is very exciting. Love to hear about the expansion of these programs. They're absolutely necessary. I hear from um, my members in East Boston and Charlestown and around the waterfront that the minute swimming classes open, the programs fill, they're at capacity. Right. Um, so I think um, this ability to grow not only just what you are doing, um, James, with the Y, but also um, with the city, um, maybe through their youth, um, uh, is it Boston Youth and Family Services? Um, but to have more partners, as you said, um, yeah, including some great partnerships that you all have to bring these swimming lessons to everyone, um, especially just not only those people that live near the water that need to know how to swim, but the people yeah. that are in our more um, in our neighborhoods that would like to come to the water and feel comfortable and safe doing that. So um, that's definitely an important part of I think our water infrastructure and something um, to hopefully expand. Well, well, thank you, Sarah. I, 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 the comments by Councillor Braden were were very interesting to me. Um, you know, as in you know, Councillor Braden, you mentioned that when you were younger, you didn't you weren't exposed to swimming lessons. And, and and I'm thinking, I'm just thinking now that, you know, Boston is, you know, we have a large immigrant community in Boston. It might be, it might be 40% or so of the, of the population, but the young people in Boston, uh, we have a large immigrant, immigrant community. And I'm just thinking out loud that they may not also have been exposed to swimming lessons in, at their own country that they were born and they came to Boston. But it's it's critically important. I mean, that lesson from Councillor Braden really, really hit home, but it's really important to make sure that our immigrant communities are also part of the, um, of, of swimming lessons and making sure that we teach them the, you know, the, the importance of water safety and respect for the ocean because they also live wherever they live and they're only one or two miles away and when you get to high school one of the first things people want to do is go is go to the ocean or go to the go to the pool yeah. with their friends or go to a cookout and then go to the lake so um you know people often jump in the ocean without knowing how to swim so mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we do everything we can um to provide the safest environment for people, but also to, to educate and train um, re our, our young people, especially. Um, so I, I, my question for you, James, is you mentioned the, the program where you're possibly going to train 30, 30 people for lifeguards. Um, are you going to also, of, of the 30 people, are we also looking to make sure that we include a diverse group of young people for that training, whether they're Im whether the immigrant families, whether they're um, communities of color or, 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 or certain areas of the city that might not traditionally have been exposed to water safety? Yeah, it's a, a great, great, great question. Um, and we're working, we're working on uh, where that training is going to take place. And um, uh, my dream um, is that it will take place at Madison Park High School. 
And the reason why we're, uh, I would like for it to be there is they've got a wonderful aquatic center, one, and two, it's, it's uh, uh, easily accessible. And three, there are two high schools there between Madison Park and O'Brien. Um, uh, we, we should be able to draw uh, students from uh, uh, the diverse communities that surround uh, that particular location. Um, and so that would be one location. And then we can choose another location uh, so that we can draw uh, young people from, you know, the other other side of our, our, our great city here. Um, so, so that we want to make sure that the, the lifeguards that we train are certainly going to be reflective of the communities we serve and the children that they will ultimately, uh, uh be keeping safe. Um, I, I'd like to also uh, share that, you know, how often do we say to ourselves in the city of Boston, um, and I think we say it often because it's true, uh, we are an asset rich community. Uh, so think about this. We've got Boys and Girls Club. We've got Boston Centers for Families and Children. We've got BPS. We've got the YMCA. We have uh, all of those all of those entities manage and control pools. What if we activated every pool in our city to make sure that every child had access to swim lessons? Um, and and we trained and we trained lifeguards at all of those different locations because they're all located throughout the city and every neighborhood that that exists in the city. Uh, we could we could have a significant impact um, on water safety and, and reduce drownings and and maybe our goal should be to eliminate drownings uh, in in 2022 by virtue of creating this this network of organizations deeply committed and supporting uh, uh, partnering with you and Sarah and all the other organizations in the in the city committed to water safety. Um, I think that's an opportunity because we do have all these pools, uh, many of which sit idle, which it's a shame to have any pool sitting idle uh, when we have such a great need. And it's a life skill. It's a life-saving skill. It's a health, a life, in, uh, life uh, uh, expanding or extending skill. Uh, health, it's a healthy habit that you can do for the, your entire lifetime. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of those activities that, that you can do from from birth to uh, birth to death, uh, like swimming. That's an that's a morbid way of thinking about it, but you know it's true. Well, well, thank you, Jim. I'm going to ask Sarah. Um, at this time, we're going to offer a closing statements or a closing message. Um, well, well, hold, hold on for one second. Um, Ron or Kerry, do we have any public testimony? No, Councillor. Just a written testimony. Okay. And and Sarah, you provided that written testimony, I believe. Actually, um, it was one of our members at PNA, but yes, okay. I think that that's and and I will also. Um, I apologize not having getting my remarks in beforehand, but I will also send written um, remarks in. For the okay. Program. So so before we go to final statements, I was going to ask my council um, colleague, Councillor Braden. Um, I know you have your hand up, Council Brady. <laughs> yeah, I, there was one other thing that um, that I, I wanted to add to the conversation that is, is educating uh, adults and everyone about how to recognize a riptide. Because when you when there's a riptide, very often the place that's most appealing is where the water's nice and smooth and it doesn't yeah. look too too treacherous and that's exactly where the problem is so yeah. um i know i have friends who are open water swimmers and one one in particular has swum the english channel and uh you know she's very concerned that uh open water swimming has is a particular swim uh, skill set and uh, but if you're well prepared and and have you, there are ways to enjoy, um, you know, swimming at the shore that are safe without um, putting a complete ban on on the activity. You know, so I think trying to um, take advantage of the folks in the neighbourhoods, like especially South Boston, you have a long tradition of open open water swimming. Uh, to take advantage of those expertise of folks who are experienced open water swimmers to educate others on on, on water safety mm -hmm. is one thing. Um, how to recognize treacherous conditions and and how to how to be as safe as possible when you're when you're doing that. So that's another piece to the the conversation I wanted to add. And thank you for your work, James and and Sarah. I think this is really critically important. And that's all I have, Councillor Flynn. 
Well, well, thank you, Councilor Braden, for you um, for being here and for your testimony and your your comments were very helpful in 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 this subject and in. We have a different pers I have a different perspective of this subject from listening to um, Councillor Braden's comments as well. So I really appreciate you being here, Councillor Braden, and um, offering your, your personal experience about this. So thank you. Um, at this time, could I ask um, Sarah if you would like to offer a, um, a closing statement or a comment? Thank you um, for, the, for the opportunity, first of all, um, to be on the panel for your advocacy in this work and for holding this hearing. Um, there are a couple of things I'd just like to reiterate, um, if I may. One, um, in terms of the water rescue infrastructure, um, we'd love to see the city and state coming together to install a notification or numbering system along the shoreline to provide a more precise location for um, water res rescue and um, reducing the time that someone's in the water. Um, we also are a strong proponent of uh, the life rings and um, having those um, more frequently along our shoreline, um, bringing in um, those waterfront properties to also assist in this um, area and training not only their staff, but also the public um, as well. And the importance to have um, language access, to have signage in multiple languages um, on instructions on life um, savers um, and life rings and also um, notification and location flags maybe of ladders um, that already exist and hopefully more ladders that are going to be coming along um, the Boston Harbor um, with wrap chains to um, as facilitate people getting out of the water um, as soon as possible, um, whether they fell off a boat or whether they fell off the shoreline or however they ended up um, in the water. Um, we also wanted just to highlight that there is um, Mass State Law, Chapter 91, that provides uh, the public access to the waterfront. And um, for those properties that are directly adjacent, they're a combination of city, state, and private-owned properties, and having the best practices and a pilot program that you mentioned um, would highlight um, a consistent safety um, model that would prevent, hopefully, people from falling in the water, enable bystanders to assist more quickly, and um, we would be pleased to share the solutions that have been talked about today um, with MassDEP, who could then also reinforce by putting these requirements into their Chapter 91 licenses that are part of um, the waterfront properties that um, are along, along our, our, our harbor. So um, those are some of the ways that we look forward to um, participating um, with the city and um, with state partners and private partners, um, such as James and all the um, activation of uh, pools in the city. It's a very exciting idea for those swimming lessons. So thank you again for the opportunity. We look forward to working for you with you all further in this initiative. And thank you, Sarah. Um, James, uh, thank you for being here with us, and I just want to give you the opportunity to offer a closing uh, closing comment. Um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Flynn. I'll, I'll make my remarks uh, uh, very brief. I'll, I'll endorse uh, uh, much of what uh, Sarah has uh, Sarah has shared with us. Uh, I believe she kind of um, um, uh, summarized it quite well. Some of the some of the ways in which we can we can make sure that our city. Um, of Boston is the is the safest city with an enormous waterfront, a beautiful waterfront that we have. Uh, uh, it is a gem. Um, uh, um, we are we are blessed to have such a naturally beautiful uh, thing to offer to the citizens of our of our city. Um, and then and then just uh, just say that um, uh, we we think that maybe one of our goals as a city uh, in in 20, uh, 2022 uh, is that strategy of of no drownings in our city. And uh, you know, let us continue to keep um, uh, keep our eye and focus on making sure that uh, water safety is something made available to adults and children throughout the city, um, and that we can we we provide as many swim lessons to as many uh, adults and children as we possibly can uh, to keep everyone uh, everyone safe and and see if we can uh, accomplish that goal of zero drownings in our city because any drowning is 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 too many. 
Um, and uh, so thank you very much for elevating this issue. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braden, uh, uh, for your, your participation and comments and guidance to us. Uh, uh, we appreciate being a part of this and, and thank you, Sarah, for everything you're doing um, in support of these issues as well. Uh, happy, to, happy to be a part of this, this team working on this important issue. Well, well, thank you, James, and thank you, Sarah. And as I mentioned to the previous panel, um, you know, I probably will have another working session um, sometime next year. I'll make sure I include you, invite you. Um, so thank you for being here with us. And the comments that you made, Sarah, you talked also about uh, language access. And thank you for bringing that important uh, part of the discussion up. We feel, I feel to mention that in my comments. So you provided um, language access that's that's critical as part of this this discussion as well. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jim, and to the team at the YMCA, the the harbor and the the ocean and pools and lakes uh, for ev everybody. Boston's an inclusive city, and because we're an inclusive city, the the ocean belongs to not one particular group, but to every group. But we want every group to enjoy the ocean in, in lakes and pools. But to enjoy an ocean in lake, we also want to provide the best education, training, water safety program that we can. So I think it's about working together with city officials, with state officials, with um, our, our leaders, such as the YMCA and various other organizations um, that are dedicated to this uh, this outreach and this support. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of Councillor Braden, I want to say thank you to James and to Sarah. Thank you to uh, Ron and Kerry from the central staff. And I already thank the, the earlier panel for being here as well. So at this time, um, this meeting is, is over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.